copyright program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 73. A burglar operating on Hollywood Boulevard between Ivar and Coenga. That's all. Rolls and quits. Mr. Lindsley, we've all heard you say that more police cars in California and Arizona use Rio Grande crack than any other brand of gasoline. But we'd like to know why. What makes Rio Grande different from any other gasoline? Rio Grande is the only gasoline in this market made by the costly Sinclair cracking process. Well, so what does that mean? Well, petroleum engineers agree that cracking creates the finest gasoline made. And Rio Grande has the finest and most modern cracking plant in America. Built by engineers of the worldwide Sinclair organization, who spent millions of dollars and years of research to perfect this cracking process. Well, doesn't that make the gasoline cost more? Yes, it costs Rio Grande more to make gasoline by this superior process. But it costs the public no more. For the same price as ordinary gasoline, you get extra power and speed. And because cracking makes it possible to get more power and energy out of every drop, the motorist actually gets more for his money out of every gallon. You mean that you actually get more mileage from Rio Grande cracked gasoline? You will find the proof of that in the records of the many police departments who use Rio Grande cracked gasoline exclusively to power all emergency cars. Police and city purchasing departments keep accurate records on every car. They continually test to find which gasoline is most economical. Do you suppose the city of Los Angeles, for example, would be using Rio Grande cracked gasoline for the third consecutive year unless the records clearly showed that it was the most efficient and economical gasoline they could buy? Well, do you make a special gasoline for police cars, or is it the same that Rio Grande cracked gasoline that your dealers sell? Rio Grande supplies cracked gasoline for the emergency equipment of Oakland, Berkeley, Fresno, Merced, Los Angeles, and Maricopa County, Arizona, and many, many others. And it's exactly the same gasoline that is supplied to independent dealers. Any motorist can stop at a Rio Grande service station, filled up with the same Rio Grande cracked gasoline that police and fire engines use, and feel the thrill of police car performance in his own car. It is now our pleasure to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. In times of economic stress, such as that from which the nation is slowly emerging, the job of policing becomes much greater and presents types whose control is a unique problem. There is, for instance, a vast floating population, migratory indigents traveling from city to city looking for work. These people are not hobos. They are not tramps. They are individuals who, under better conditions, would be hard at work at some gainful occupation. They must, however, be watched, for the peace of adversity will often tempt a man to break the law. Hard times cause unrest among the people, and this condition must be watched, lest it flare into dangerous demonstrations, which may threaten the peace and security of the vast majority. And the Depression has created many freak criminals. One of these is the subject of our story tonight. Under normal economic conditions, this man probably would not have broken the law. But forced to the wall by circumstances, he reasoned unclearly that the world owed him a living. He set out to collect, and he made his collection in such a manner as to, frankly, baffle the police for many months. His case will go down in our record as that of a depression lawbreaker. Listen to his story. But I advise you, do not go and do likewise. 
November 1931. A.B. Humphreys, manager of the Owl Drug Store at Hollywood and Cahuenga Boulevard, is standing before for the safe in the basement. Slowly he turns the dial. One by one the tumblers click. The big door swings open. What's this? George. George! Where is that janitor? George! Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, come down here. Come in, sir. But where y'all was, sir? What time did you come in to mop up this morning? Five o'clock, I expect you were. Maybe a night later. Were the doors all locked? Oh, yes, sir. Locked tight. You've been all over the store? Yes, sir. Haven't noticed anything unusual? No, sir, I haven't. Oh, that's strange. Very strange. What's the matter with you, Mr. Humphreys? You all as pale as a ghost. George, there was more than a thousand dollars in that safe last night. And now look. Why, there ain't nothing in there. That's a fit. We've been robbed. Maybe not, Miss Humphreys. Maybe Mr. Buell put the money someplace else last night when he closed up. Maybe, but I doubt it. Anyway, I'll call him up and find out. Hello. Sorry to bother you. It's early in the morning, Jim. Oh, hello, Abe. What's on your mind? What'd you do with the cash last night? Put it in the safe, of course. Well, this isn't there now. What? Are you sure you locked the safe? Positive. Well, you'd better get in some clothes and get down here. I'm going to report this thing to the main office, and they'll probably send a man out who'll want to question us. Oh, okay. I'll be right down. The Owl Drug Company assigns their special investigator, Bill Smith, a former Army intelligence officer. And he loses no time in questioning Mr. Humphreys and his assistant. Mr. Humphreys... Who beside yourself knew the combination of that place? Mr. Buell and the district supervisor. I see. Well, you know about this is that you discovered the safe locked and the money gone when you opened up this morning. That's right. Mr. Buell. Yes? Yeah. Would you mind telling me the circumstances of last night? Well, there weren't any circumstances. I don't know what you mean. You closed the store? Yes. You deposited the money in the safe? Yes, I did the same as I always do. Closed up at 11 o'clock, entered the cash registers, counted the money back in the prescription department, and filled out a statement and duplicate. Eh? Okay. One of the district supervisor last year. About three weeks ago. Oh, but you don't I'm think that... I'm not thinking anything yet. How about that janitor, George? He's on duty from five until noon. He has no way of knowing the combination of the safe. And he's absolutely trustworthy. Why, he's been with the company for ten years. I see. Well, I guess that's all the information I need from you gentlemen. Just carry on business as usual, and don't mind me. But let's snoop around and see what I can turn up. In addition to Special Investigator Smith, Los Angeles detectives are assigned to the case. Detective Lieutenant Leon D. Egan and C.W. Gaines meet with Smith to compare notes. Well, Bill, from what you've told me, I can come to only one conclusion. What's that, Egan? The safe was open, not blown. After the money was taken, it was closed and locked. The burglar alarm system wasn't set off. The store wasn't broken into. It was an inside job. Well, that might be the answer. Certainly, it's the obvious conclusion to arrive at, but somehow I, I can't agree with it. Well, why not? Because I know something more about the employees involved than you do. Only three men had the combination of that safe. And all three are absolutely reliable. Been with the company for years. Did you ever hear of the faithful bank clerk who embezzled funds on the anniversary of his 40th year with the bank? Oh, yes, I know. But I'm backing my belief on the integrity of these men with something more. I've questioned them all. I've let them feel that they're under suspicion. Their reaction showed me that they were not suffering from guilty consciences. Ah, a psychological clue, huh? Mm, maybe. Well, what's the next step? We're ready to assist. No, no. We're still looking the place over. I've had fingerprints taken on the safe, but they haven't given us a clue. I'm going to hang around and see if I can pick up anything more. I'll let you know if I need you. Okay, Bill. Anytime. But a couple of days later, it is Egan who contacts Smith with the startling news that the Anita dress shop next door to the drugstore had been robbed. 
Together, they interviewed the excited proprietor. Uh, I just can't understand this, gentlemen. I put the cash in the back room, same as usual, locked the safe, and, and fastened the back door. Then I locked the front door and set the burglar alarm. And, and this morning, when I when I opened up, the money's gone. Mm, who else has a key to the place besides you? Well, I, I'm the only one. I opened the store and I closed it myself. And I had this, Bill. A regular night watchman and a harness bull within a block of the place all night, and no one heard the burglar alarm go off. It didn't go off. The burglar alarm company has no record of this alarm being turned in. Does that alarm connect with all the doors and windows? Yes. How much did they get? Almost $100. Oh, Negan, let's have a look around the back here. Well, what do you say now, Bill? Same sort of a job as your owl robbery. Yes, it is. And it's an inside job. Inside job? What well, could it be? Why would this man rob himself? Well, I can't answer that one. That's the only way it could happen. Maybe, but I don't think so. Well, you give me the answer then. Can't. I'm still looking for it. And a few days later, at a nearby shop in the same block... Yes, sir? What can I do for you? I'm looking for one of these new noiseless typewriters. Yes, sir. Right this way. We come to the right place, all right. We carry everything in typewriters from the old-fashioned three-bank portable to the latest noiseless. Now, this model here... Yes. That's funny. What's the matter? Why, last night there was a noiseless on this table. A brand new demonstration model. This morning it's not... Just a minute, I'll ask the manager. Oh, Mr. Evans. Uh, yes, Marjorie? What happened to the noiseless demonstrator? Have you sold it? Why, why, no. It was there on the table last night. Well, it's not here this morning. Look for yourself. Well, well we've been robbed. Oh. Look, you better call the police right away, Marjorie. Yes, sir. Uh, now, mister, can't I interest you in something in the rebuilt line? Now, now, here's a very excellent machine here. While Smith and Egan go through the same fruitless round of questions at the typewriter store, a new factor enters the mystery when a gentleman visits the captain of detectives at the Hollywood station. And how do you do, Captain? I'm Howard Strong. My company installs and services burglar alarms. Oh, yes, Mr. Strong. Sit down. I'm glad to make your acquaintance. Thank you. Now, what can I do for you? We have our alarm systems in the old drug store at Hollywood and Tuanga. We need to dress up in Hollywood typewriter store. I see. The three places that have been burglarized recently. Precisely. Yeah? And we want to know just what you've done about these burglaries. Well, we're doing everything we can, Mr. Strong. We've questioned the victims and found their answers about the same. They can't help us, and there are no fingerprints or clues. Now, none of our alarms in these places of business have functioned at the time of the burglary. Well, have your alarms been tampered with? No. I've gone over them personally, and they're all in perfect condition. Well, it's all very mysterious. And there's only one conclusion I can come to. And what's that? The thieves have been inside your... Mr. Strong, it isn't reasonable to assume that they're inside jobs. And why not? Well, either my men or myself have questioned all the possible suspects, including everyone who has a key to the stores or access to the safe, as the case may be. And we're convinced that they are innocent. Hmm. One burglary might be suspected of being an inside job, but not three in a row within a few doors of each other. Well, what is your theory? Well, of course, there might be something wrong with your alarm system. That, Captain, is an impossibility. Yet you're inferring that there's something wrong with our police system. No, 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 it's not that, Captain, but, well, I'm interested in getting at the bottom of it. Yes, yes, of course. And after all, men may break down, but of course machines never do. They're in power. Mm -hmm. right? Now, there's no need to take that attitude, Captain. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do, Mr. Strong. I'll triple the number of patrolmen on the Hollywood Boulevard beat, and I'll throw another radio car into the district. If these jobs aren't being pulled by ghosts, we'll get the boys that are pulling them. <laughs> The double guard goes on the boulevard. The extra radio car patrols Hollywood. And for a couple of weeks, nothing happens. Then one morning in a hosiery shop between Cosmo Street and Coenda on the Hollywood Boulevard. Mr. Green, I need some tennis before we open up. I'll get some out of the thing for you, Sally. Hey, Millie, you think that old buzzer'd leave a little change in the register at night? Instead of locking it all up in the safe. Who the devil's break in the wrist, self? You think he was peddling diamonds instead of false stockings? Sally! Call the police! Quick! Bring it up! And 
a few days later, a few doors down the street. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Why, uh, <laughs> I'd like a pair of those Clark Gable Oxford with the high keeping heels. Yes, sir. What, uh... Oh, I'll try to squeeze in at nine. Yes, sir. Won't you be seated? Thanks. Oh, what's the devil is this? Hey, hey, Mr. Robbins. Mr. Robbins, there's four pairs of Clark Gable's in there. Hello, Steve. This is Eddie out at Hollywood. Yeah? Description of stolen property for tomorrow's police bulletin. Sure. One set Walter Hagen golf clubs, four dozen tennis balls, three spalding rackets. Hey, what kind of a burglar is that? Search me, but I'm getting tired of hearing about him. It's our old friend at Hollywood and Coanga. What's the matter with you guys out there? Can't you catch that guy? Now, Stephen, don't you start to. That's all we hear from morning to night. From the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences down to the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> if you think this bird's so easy to catch, come on out and catch him yourself. Oh, thanks. You're smart to say that. I'm spending my nights from now on staked out in the smarter Hollywood Boulevard shop. <laughs> Of all the jobs I ever had, this one takes the cake. Oh, it isn't so bad. It isn't so bad. Sitting here night after night in a perfume shop waiting for a guy to knock it over? Well, we've tried everything else. Now we simply have to sit down and wait for him. Yeah, but sitting here for a week and nothing happens. Except that when I get home in the morning, thinking of Tozor L'Amour and all this other junk, my old lady just won't believe what I've been doing. <laughs> And I'll swear the beef with her after we've caught the guy. Hmm, I should live so long. Oh, there's the boys in the radio car just pulled up. Let's go out and get a breath of fresh air. Okay, but if one of them mugs makes a crack about me smelling like a certain flower, I'm going to let him have it. Oh, <laughs> forget it. I asked him to bring us some sandwiches and coffee. Come on. How about the burglar we got a date with? Well, a couple of the boys are out in the alley. Anyway, we'll only be gone a minute. Come on. Floor's been empty. Right under our noses. What a couple of cats we are. Throw on the lights, Eddie. I'll get to that. I'll look for him in this room. I'll go to the back room. But the two officers find nothing. And the guards on the outside have seen no one enter or leave the building. The nocturnal depredations of the strange burglar take on an eerie aspect. The nerves of the overworked police are stretched to the breaking point. They begin actually to believe that they are trying to outwit a supernatural being who can melt through thick stone walls. Weeks pass, and still the robberies go on. And then one night, the owl drug store is visited again. Mr. Humphreys sends for Egan and Smith. Well, Mr. Humphreys, what is it this time? We had a visit from our mystery man again last night. What did he get this time? He didn't touch the safe. What? Any narcotics missing? No. Is there anything missing? Yes. And I'll be darned if I can understand it. He took 15 gallons of hydrochloric acid and 15 gallons of nitric acid. Mm. What? Yes. 30 gallons of corrosive acid. Oh, that doesn't make sense. This guy must be a human trade rat. What the devil can he want with all that acid? That means it sounds dangerous. What do you mean? I don't know for sure, but nitric and hydrochloric acid are dangerous things to monkey with. They yeah, have homicidal intent. Yeah, but you can't kill a person with acid. No. I think you take a bath in it or have a glass full thrown in my face. And while 
while the police are pondering the significance of the latest death of the Midnight Phantom, he suddenly strikes again, four blocks west on Hollywood Boulevard, shooting from a five and ten cent store, a clothing store, a furniture store. The situation becomes increasingly more desperate for the merchants along Hollywood Boulevard. Insurance rates go up. A feeling of uneasiness pervades the shopping district. And for all of the intensive efforts of the police, the burglaries continue unchecked as the week stretch into months. Then one morning, Bill Smith is summoned into the office of a high official of the Owl Drug Company. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, sir. Suppose you want to know what I'm doing about the Hollywood robberies. Well, I'm keeping my eyes on the Owl store at Hollywood and North Farmers. I think you're working in that section now. Wait a minute, Bill. Not so fast. I didn't call you in for that. Oh, I thought not. Well, unfortunately, I've got some more grief for you. If you want me taking off the job, I can't blame you. All I can say is I've done all I can. Hold well, on, Bill. Hold on. You seem to be jumping at conclusions this morning. No wonder I'd jump at anything. I'm so balled up over these robberies. Well, Bill, there's been another one. Another one? Where? When? At the Hollywood going to store last night. Well, how'd the call cash it? Oh, no, Bill. Five hundred dollars this time. Five hundred dollars, eh? I'm licked. No, no, you're not. Not as far as I'm concerned at any rate. Frankly, I don't know what to do next. I don't believe it. That fertile brain of yours will figure out the next step. This case is still yours if you want it. Well, if you still believe in me, sir, I think I know something that might work. The last chance, but I think I'll go out and talk to you about it. <laughs> No matter where else this guy strikes, he seems to come back to that old drugstore at Hollywood and Coinga. Yeah, it looks that way. Even if he only wants to steal a postage stamp, he'd steal it there. Right. Well, then, but I camp right down there in the basement at the owl, right for the safe. You mean you're going to take it out yourself? Right. Yeah, but you might sit there for six months and never see a thing. Sure, but it'll be worth it to get this guy. I'll sit there the rest of my life if I have to. If you'll help me. Sure, I'll do anything I can. Fine. What'll it be? I want you to patrol the outside. And men on Coenga and on Hollywood near the store. Also men in the alley. Okay. But Bill, we can't tie up a lot of men indefinitely. Play along with me for a month or so, and I'll bet in that time we'll get our men. Okay. I'll sit down there in the dark. The first person to come into that cellar will get a load of buckshot from me. I don't care who he is. You hear a shot. It'll be your cue to keep your eyes open. Buckshot will only wound him. And we'll try to make a break for the outside. Okay, Bill. When do we start? Tonight, of course. And so Bill Smith takes up his lonely vigil in the basement of the drugstore. Night after night, he sits in the gloomy, cold room, unable to move about, unable to smoke or read, not daring even to much a sandwich left his unknown and mysterious party to hear him and be frightened away. The only light Bill sees in his self-imposed prison is the weak blue glare from the corner street lamp which filters through the sidewalk grating. The only sound he hears are the occasional muffled footsteps of a belated merrymaker hurrying home to bed. Thus does Bill Smith pass eight hours a night for a week, for two weeks, for three weeks. Eight cold, bone-stiffening, torturous hours of black boredom. Each morning sees him climb from the cellar exhausted from the tension under which he has sat and waited. Each evening sees him descend to his cave more wan, more fatigued, less convinced that he will ever get his man. And then one night, after nearly a month of fruitless vigil, he hears a scratching sound that seems to come from the east wall of the basement, a sound such as a rat might make. He listens intently, half rises to his feet, grasps his shotgun, Five, ten, fifteen seconds, a half minute ticks by. And then a more definite sound, a metallic grating. And in the faint light, the screw of ventilator is shoved out of place and lifted downward by a human hand. Without a second hesitation, Smith swings his shotgun to his shoulder and... Before he can take another shot, the hand is hastily withdrawn. Smith switches on the light, hastens the pile of boxes to the ventilator, tries to time through... Outside, the officers patrolling the neighborhood have heard the signal shot. On the TV, Lieutenant Gaines in the alley behind the immediate dress shop has drawn his gun. Plans tense, ready for action. When the shadowy figure, seen to materialize from the black mass of the darkened building, scuttles across the alley. Hold! Hold on, shoot! Okay, boys, we're gonna have it. 
You're badly hurt? I don't know. All right. Take him down, boys. You don't have to bother about that. I don't know that, my dear. Get a call for the ambulance, Eddie, and let Bill Smith know we got his man. The midnight phantom, wounded slightly in the hip, is taken to the general hospital to receive medical attention and then faces the officers of the law. Well, my friend, I'm looking at you a good many months. When well, we've got you, I want to find out what it's all about. You willing to talk? Yes, I guess so. I let you guys on the run for a long time. Yeah, you can have the answer now. Go ahead, Chief. Well, let's start at the beginning. What's your name? Herbert C. Wright. What's it all about, Wright? And the way I figured out things is this. Times are tough. So I figured out how I could ride out to depression and not have to bother about where my next meal's coming from. By stealing, huh? Oh, we could call it that. What we want to know is how you did it. Been watching for you on the boulevard in the back of the store for months. Yeah, I'm coming to that. There's too much chance for regular burglars. I plan mine carefully. I figured I could get away with a perfect crime. Nobody has yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll find that out. But I nearly got away with it. That's because I took plenty of time. I looked over downtown Los Angeles and Hollywood both before I went to work on the corner of Hollywood and Coen. Well, why did you pick that spot? Because with the exception of the owl building, the rest of the stores were built without cellars, with a two or three foot airspace between the ground and the floors of the building. You can tell me you dug your way into those stores? Oh, sure. I burrowed under the stores and cut my way through the floors. Made myself trap doors that wouldn't be detected. Then I got into the owl basement but trying to use the ventilator boat. That's why I pulled the owl job and the I need a dress shop and a typewriter job. I started to work east. I found somebody else who got the same idea once before. But because there was a tunnel already made. So I used that. And I got under Cosmo Street and almost to the Broadway. Were you planning on burglarizing the Broadway? Sure. They do plenty of business there. There's something I'd like to know. The devil did you steal those jars of acid from the owls? Oh. That. I was going to tell you about them. It's lucky none of you guys found my tunnel and tried to follow it. Why? I had jars of acid placed along the tunnel with cords arranged to trip them. Anybody who didn't know where they was, well, the acid could have spilled all over them. And then the best trap of them all was a big plant over the entrance to my living quarters. It was studded with spikes and weighted with 50 bricks. I bet it would have killed a man if it had fallen on him. You're a nice, pleasant sort of guy, aren't you? Well, I had to live, didn't I? I got as much right to live as the rest of them. I was only protecting my interest. The same way as a businessman protects his with burglar alarms. Or a manufacturer with armed guards when there's a strike. Well, let's pass over that delicate ethical point. There's something I want to ask you. What's that? You mentioned living quarters. What did you mean by that? Oh. I burrowed out a room under one of the shops in the middle of the block. I had blankets in there. And the typewriter I stole. I was writing a novel. It was quite comfortable. If it looked too dangerous for me to go outside, I could stay in there for several days. Not your idea of living. Sure, oh, why not? It's as good the life as any you can get these days. I know. <laughs> I tried. You mean you tried? Well, during the days, I'd go out and try to get work. But if I couldn't find any, I wanted to go straight. No, that's... Not that I... What I did was crooked, you understand? Oh, sure, we understand. Yeah, but I couldn't find a job. So, this is easy. Why did you take 20 cents out of that shoe store and leave $2,000 behind? Well, I didn't have any particular use for the money at the time, and I didn't want to run the risk of depositing too much in the bank at one time. I figured there'd be more whenever I wanted it. And how about the combinations to the safe? How did you get them? Well, you see, I bored people in the wall. So in the floor of every store I worked. And then I watched through the people and then the combinations that way. 
Uh, sometimes it took several days. How could he was with it? <laughs> of course, you nearly had me that night in the perfume store. I was watching for the people when you came back and found the place robbed. I could hardly keep from laughing out loud. Yeah, I can imagine that must have been very funny. Now, you've asked me a lot of questions. I want to ask you one. Well, that's fair enough. What is it? Why the devil didn't you bump me off tonight? I'd be a lot better off than some of the world. Why anyone wants to spend another minute on this lousy earth is more than I can understand. <laughs> Regardless of his opinion, Harold Wright will have to spend several more years on this earth. For just a few months ago, he was brought to trial, found guilty to three counts of burglary, and sentenced to San Quentin Penitentiary for the term prescribed by law. A further proof that crime doesn't pay. Thank you, Chief Davis. Many listeners tonight will want to know more about the case of the human mole. And we refer them to the April issue of the Calling All Cars News, which contains the full story of this amazing Hollywood burglar with pictures of his hideaways. Any Rio Grande service station will gladly give you a free copy of this unique publication, which contains true detective stories, movie and radio news. Just drive into any Rio Grande station and ask for the news. There's no obligation to buy any Rio Grande cracked gasoline, but if you're interested in getting more value for your money, we ask you to try a tank full and see what a vast difference this famous cracking process makes. It costs no more to enjoy police car performance in your car. This is your narrator.